I think uh, most of you would agree that our, our view, our perception of God is a very important part of our lives. It's, it's very important to our spiritual growth, to our, our spiritual well-being. And, and yet, it, it's so easy for us to get out of balance in our view of God. For example, there are people who believe that God wants them to torture themselves in order to appease his wrath. And so they whip and they cut and they pierce and they, they deny themselves believing that God requires those kind of actions from his followers. That's a pretty extreme view. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are people who are convinced that God exists only to gratify the whims and the wishes of his children. And like a, a, a doting old grandfather, uh, he indulges their every desire, makes no demands, imposes no discipline at all. That's the other extreme. We need balance. We really need balance. And today's study from the Minor Prophets portrays the true and the living God in a balanced way. Our study the message we're going to look at is from the prophet Nahum. Could I ask you to take a Bible, because I'm not going to have any verses on the screen. I'd like you to open a Bible to Nahum. Will you please? You may have brought your own Bible. Maybe there's one. You can take one from the, the pew, the songbook rack. But please, we're going to be reading and looking at a number of things from this prophet. Now, before we kind of get to that, when was the last time you read Nahum? Maybe for some of you, never. And I don't say that to lay a guilt trip on you, believe me. That's not what I'm trying to do. But isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that there are parts of the scripture that some of us have never read or seldom read? And yet, this is part of God's inspired word. And I want to promise you, Nahum does have a very important message for us living in this day and age. Now, I want to give you a little background, as I've tried to do on all the prophets. Nahum lived and preached sometime between the fall of Thebes in Egypt in 663 B.C., sometime between that event and the, the fall of Nineveh in 612 B.C. His message is directed to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians. Now, you may recall that maybe 150 years before Nahum, Jonah had preached to Nineveh. And the people had heard, they had listened, and they obeyed that message, and they repented, and God spared them the disaster he had planned. But by Nahum's time, 150 years later, Assyria had, had reverted to its old ways of violence and bloodshed and cruelty and oppression. I love what one writer said. He said, the Assyrians had repented of their repentance. <laughs> they had repented earlier, now they're, they've repented of that, and they've gone back to their old ways. Nahum's message is that Nineveh and Assyria is to be completely destroyed. Look at some of his words. Chapter 1, verse 8. He, talking about God, will make an end to Nineveh. Chapter 1, verse 14. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Chapter 1, verse 15. They, talking about the Assyrians, will be completely destroyed. Chapter 2, verse 7. It is decreed that Nineveh shall be exiled and carried away. Chapter 3, verse 8, I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. Now, that's exactly what happened. All of those passages came to be. This large, powerful city and the empire that it represented, but especially the city, was so completely destroyed that for centuries no one knew where it had stood. In fact, it was not until 1842 that archaeologists discovered the site of ancient Nineveh and began excavations. I want you to think about this. Nineveh is a large city. 
The walls of Nineveh were about seven and a half miles in circumference. Those walls were so wide that three chariots could drive abreast on those walls. The city boasted 1,200 defensive towers on the walls. There was a moat outside the city. It had a remarkable river and canal system. It was the center of commerce. It was the Wall Street of its day. And yet, at God's decree, it was so completely destroyed that for centuries, no one even remembered where that city had stood. And it all happened quickly. This didn't happen over two or three centuries. This happened within a generation. And it was gone. Now, Nineveh is an object lesson to the people and the empires of the modern world. This object lesson teaches us the eternal principle of divine sovereignty, that God is sovereign, God is in control. And it also teaches the absolute necessity for national and individual righteousness if a nation is going to survive. That's a little background. Let's look now at the message that, Nineveh, that Nahum delivered to, to Nineveh because there are several other contemporary lessons that emerge. First of all, this is going to surprise you, I think. There's a message of comfort and consolation. In fact, the name Nahum means comfort. But you're going to ask, where in the world is a message of comfort in this book of judgment and doom? It all seems so negative. I don't see any comfort there. I don't see any consolation. Well, in its original setting, God was comforting Judah. He's comforting his people. Listen to these passages. If your Bibles are open, chapter 1, verse 12, the middle part of verse 12. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke, the Assyrian yoke. I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. Or look at chapter 1, verse 15. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah. Fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked, the Assyrians, no more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Or look at chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, though destroyers have laid them waste and ruined their lives. God is saying this to speak comfort to his people. And he's saying, when you see your enemy coming against you, remember that God is your God and he will rise up to protect you. What a needed message for our time. We live in a world that that seems, where, where it seems that, that the evil is going to win. Would you agree with that? It just seems most of the time that evil is going to win. It's a world where righteous people suffer for doing good and criminals prosper. But God is saying through Nahum and many other places in the word, don't ever believe that wickedness will ultimately triumph. It will not. I am a God of justice. I will punish evil and I will reward good. Nineveh is just a historical example, a biblical example of how that actually happened. So there's a message of comfort. There's a message of consolation. Don't give up. Hang on because God is a God of justice. But also, well, there is that message that our God is a God of justice and grace. He does bring judgment against evil and he always gives a warning before he does. He extends to the sinner, he extends to the sinful nation, the opportunity to repent. Folks, I want you to remember this. God takes no joy in seeing people punished. God takes no joy in that. In fact, I think I read this passage just a few weeks ago, but it keeps coming back to me. Uh, Peter expressed God's attitude with these words, that God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Do you hear that? God doesn't want anyone to perish, but instead wants everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. God does not enjoy seeing people punished. 
So he's a God of patience, a God of grace, but also a God of judgment. As Nahum preached to Nineveh, sent this message to Nineveh, he used a, a terrible, awful, frightening phrase. You find it in chapter 2, verse 13. You find it again in chapter 3, verse 5, when God says, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. Oh, my. I am against you. What terrible words to be spoken to any person, to any nation. I am against you. Now, we all recall a very famous and, and familiar verse, Romans chapter 8, 31, where Paul said, if God's for us, who can be against us? Nahum presents the flip side of that. If God is against us, who can be for us? To amplify that warning, Nahum reminds Assyria of some of her earlier conquests. See, the Assyrians at one point had gone all the way down to Egypt, 663, and they had, they had taken, they had captured and destroyed the city of Thebes. And here's what God's saying. This is chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, although I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. Do you remember what you did to Thebes? You know the confederacy of nations that, that supported her? Remember how secure that city was with its moats and its canals and the river? But you went in and you overthrew that city. The same thing is going to happen to you, Nineveh. Folks, if God is opposed to a nation, no set of allies, no defense system, no military strength, no economic system can save it. Only one thing can make a difference, repentance, turning back to God. And that's what God was looking for in Assyria. Looked for it in Jonah's time, it happened. Looked for it in Nineveh's time, it did not happen. But in his mercy and in his patience, he always forewarns before he brings judgment. Now, for one final thought about Nahum's message, the prophet gives us some real valuable insights into the very nature of God. I want you to listen to three statements from chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord, Yahweh, is a jealous and avenging God. I want you to hear that. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. Then in verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. And then verse 7, just part of that verse, the Lord is good. Dave, thanks for singing that song. Oh God, you've been good. The Lord is good. Now is that, is that confusing? How can the Lord be jealous and good at the same time? Don't the attributes of vengeance and patience cancel each other out? I mean, how can God be both of those things? Well, if you think those attributes cancel each other out, you, you couldn't be further from the truth. His goodness and his anger are inexpre uh, explicitly tied together. You can't separate them. And, and I want you to think about what that means. When the Bible here in chapter 1 says that God is jealous, it uses a word which means to have great zeal, almost enthusiasm. It refers to the depth of emotion that stirs God to act. So zealous is God for his people. So zealous is God for his will and, and, and for the preservation of his own nature that he will not allow anything to stand in the, in the way. He is zealous, jealous for his people. And then when we read that God is an avenging God, boy, that brings all kinds of thoughts, doesn't it? You know what I usually think of? When I think of God being an avenging God, I, I think of retaliation. And that presents some problems because I don't want a God who retaliates against me. Retaliation is simply one person getting even with another, right? You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. And we don't want a God who says, hey, you disobeyed me? Boy, you're going to get it. I'm going to get even with you. We don't want a God who gets even. So if you think retaliation, you're going in the wrong direction. But there's another word that describes this, and that's the word retribution. 
That speaks of a system of justice that punishes wrongdoing. And this is a very important attribute for God to possess. Think about this for a moment. If we as a society do not practice retribution, if we do not punish people for wrongdoing, we actually insult that person because we're not holding him or her accountable. In essence, if you just let things pass, you are saying to people, you are insignificant. Your actions don't count, so just, we're going to let it go. We can't do that. When parents fail to discipline their children, they are sending the same message. They are saying to their kids, you're insignificant. You really don't count. Now, some of you parents may think, well, I just want to get along. I want to be a good buddy. I want to be a pal. And I don't want to practice discipline. Whenever you fail to practice discipline for wrongdoing, you are saying to your kids, you really don't matter. You really don't count. And that's what God would be saying if he were not a God of vengeance. So if this is true, when, when we hear God exercising vengeance, then we know that he's saying, you are significant. You count. Through Nahum, God was telling the Assyrians, you're accountable for your actions. You are significant, and I will hold you accountable for what you've done and for who you are and who you've become. He is saying, you count. He can't just say, oh, all right, I don't care what you do. God cannot do that. It's not within his nature to do that. God places human beings in a position of tremendous significance. He tells us that everything we do is important. And when we do evil, he will hold us accountable, just like he did the Assyrians. Now, we're also told that in those verses I read from chapter 1 that God is patient. He's always willing to give people the opportunity to face their sin and to repent. Gives us time to turn back to him. That's why scripture says in our, in our book for today and in many other places that God is slow to anger. He is patient. And then finally, verse 7, he is good. We like that one. He is good. Let me tell you how you see his goodness. You see his goodness in his jealousy his vengeance, his wrath, and his patience. That's where his goodness is seen. If God were not angry with sin, he would not be good. If God was not committed to justice, he would not be just. If God did not hold evildoers accountable, he would not be righteous. All of those things have to be taken together. We need that balanced view of who God is. Now, what does all that from Nahum have to do with us? Well, just this. In his letter to the Romans, Paul extols both the righteousness and the faithfulness of God. He speaks very openly and clearly about our sinful condition in chapter 1. He talks about God's commitment to the judgment of evil in chapter 2 verse 5 just listen this is just an example of what Paul says listen to this Paul New Testament writing to Christians but because of your stubbornness and your unrepented heart you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed Romans 2 5 I would encourage you to go home and read Romans 2, verses 5 through 11, where that whole idea is developed. So God says God is, or Paul says God is a God of righteousness. He's a God of judgment. But then, as you know, in the letter to the Romans, he launches into a discussion of a most wonderful truth. That God, the awesome judge... God, the, the, the one committed to holiness, the one committed to righteousness, assumed our humanity. And in the person of Jesus Christ, he took our sin, he took our guilt upon himself. The holy, righteous wrath of God was placed on Christ, and it's in him that we see our way to freedom and to forgiveness.
That's the good news. God's not any different. The God of the Old Testament isn't different from the God of the New Testament. He is still a God of justice and judgment. He's still a God of wrath, a God of holiness and righteousness. But all of that has been dealt with for us in Christ Jesus. And that's the good news. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. And I want to ask today as I finish this lesson, have you tasted the goodness and the kindness of God? If you have, it will lead you to turn to him, to put your trust in him, to serve him faithfully. Yes, you have to understand the God of justice, the God who brings judgment against evil. But I want you also to know the kindness and the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. And when you know that, wow, you do turn to him. You will turn away from your sin. You will put your trust in him and you'll serve him faithfully. We hope that you will think about making those kind of decisions in your life today.